Good evening. I'd like first to thank Kat Lux and Damien Krzyzewski for inviting me to this Ecological Metamorphosis lecture series. My talk is entitled The Historian and the Planet, Thinking Regimes of Planetarity at the Intersection of World Ecologies, Environmental Reflexivities and Geopower Configuration. Let me start with Donald Worster, a pioneer of environmental history. The older history he wrote in 1990 could hardly deny that people had been living for a long time on this planet, but its general disregard of that fact suggested that they were not and are not truly part of the planet. Environmental historians, on the other hand, realize that scholarship can no longer afford to be so naive. As Donald Worster underlined, a key achievement of environmental history has been to bring to light a world of interdependencies between humans and living beings, between humans and the Earth. Interdependencies that modernist historical narratives have tended to obscure. I see a second but no less important achievement in the recent years. At the crossroad of environmental history and history of science and technology, scholars have documented past societies' perceptions and knowledge of their changing environment. One or two decades ago, to attribute to societies of the 16th, 17th, 18th or 19th centuries a kind of awareness of the interrelation of their dynamics with large-scale environmental and climatic dynamics was deeply suspect among historians of committing the sin of anachronism. The matter had been heard. Past centuries, societies may have had some local environmental problems and some concerns and knowledge about these isolated notices of subject, but no global environmental consciousness prior to the second half of the 20th century, and they had not encountered the planet until even more recently. The historical work that have flourished in the last years goes against this standard view. They show that many forms of environmental reflexivity that evolved in the last centuries were not limited to interactions with the immediate local environment, but can be called planetary in the sense that they encompassed ideas and practices to make sense of the interaction of humans with phenomena developing across large spatial and temporal scales and addressed the balance, functionings and correct use of the Earth as a whole. To make this clearer, let me synthesize recent works on 16th and 17th century Europe. First, the business of circumnavigation with its knowledge practices forged a new attitude towards the planet. It is interesting to note that the Roman emperors since the 4th century have readily called themselves Dominus Totius Orbis, Orbis or globe now being preferred to Mundus, and also that medieval theologian called for a general conversion before the end of time, not only in terms of conversio totus totius Mundus, but also of conversio totius Orbis at Christum, Christum. hence inscribing Christian universalism on the spherical physicality of the planet. However, the circumnavigations and the associated geopolitics constituted the Earth in the 16th, 16th century as a new totality to be traveled, known, measured, and dominated. The ancient metaphor of Theatrum Mundi, a synoptic, synoptic view of the world, the ancient Oikumene limited to three continents, shifted to that of Theatrum Orbis Terrarum, a synoptic view of the Terraceous globe or Orbis Universalis, 
seen from the sky or from the eyes of God. The papal bull Romanus Pontifex of 1455, which encouraged Portuguese expansion and legitimized the enslavement of Africans, staged the Pope as successor of the key bearer of the, of the kingdom of heaven and vicar of Jesus Christ, contemplating with a fatherly spirit all the multiple climates of the world and the characteristics of all the nations that inhabit it." Unquote. The climates then being understood since Trabo as closely um, as, uh, sorry, as closely determined by the latitude and in limited number, five or seven, this expression of the multiple climates therefore inscribed papal authority on a physical ground, the diverse climates, as well as on a socio-political one, the diverse nations. As you see here above on the map, the Nine, the 1493 Intercetera Berber divided the planet between Spanish sovereignty and Portuguese sovereignty by, I quote the <coughs> bubble, tracing and establishing a line going from the Arctic Pole, here in after called the North, to the South Pole, here in after called the South. End quote. A bit later, in the 1520s, world maps, globes, and cosmographic knowledge held a central place in the diplomatic battle between Charles V and John III to determine whether the Moluccas Iceland belonged to the east Spanish side or to the west Portuguese side of a second meridian line 180 degrees from the Tordesillas line which you see on both sides uh, on, on the map uh, below. Uh, Diogo Rivero's, Ribeiro's map that you see below uses the most sophisticated cartographic knowledge to make the claim that Moluccas were on the Spanish side. So, as a new, so a new geopolitics was being written and legitimized on the very physicality of the planet with two longitudinal rays from pole to pole, traced by a ruler of all the multiple climates of the world, which were now seen, all the world, all the climates now seen as habited or potentially habitable, including the antipodes and the torrid zone. Political and spiritual sovereignty, the new geographical concept of the Earth, where earth and water formed a single physically and geographically unified globe, traversable and habitable in almost any point, and the astronomical concept of the earth as a spherical body interdependent with other planets with its, with its latitudinal bands of climates in rotation and moving around the sun. So these three political and spiritual sovereignty geographical concept of the Earth and astronomical concept of the Earth, all converged to produce a new relation to planet Earth. As Jeremy Broughton, Dennis Cosgrove and others have shown, a new geo-knowledge, geo-power hence emerged, bringing together theological, astronomical, astrological, meteorological, geographic, historical, political, and economic perspectives. A second operator of early modern Western large-scale environmental reflexivity was the question of the water cycle and the links between forests and rain. Such links were already discussed by Christopher Columbus as Fresos and Loche have documented. From Gonzalo Fernandez de Oviedo y Valdez to Thomas Burnett and John Ray, sailors, scientists, and theologians of the 16th and 17th century envisioned the circulation of water on a global scale, with teleconnections going from the equators to the poles, from oceans to continents, from mountains to plains, from forest to soil fertility, and so on. 
a third key operator of modern, of early modern planetary environmental reflexivity was the question of human action as a telluric force on the planet. From Le Terre di Filosofia Naturale by Camilla Aculiani in 1584 to Sacred Theory of the Earth by Thomas Burnett in the late 17th century, the story of Noah's flood was thought as a pivotal event in the history of the planet. Was the flood described in the scriptures a universal phenomenon that could be corroborated by the study of fossil marine organisms to be found on today's continent? Asked the 16th and 17th naturalists and the the theologians. If by natural means, it would be impossible to produce a universal fluid, which is to say for the entire Earth to be covered by waters, as Jean Buridan stated at the beginning of the 15th century, then would this not be an evidence of the universal character uh, of the fluid and prove God's supernatural intervention? Another question was, have human spiritual wanderings changed the face of the earth? So the multiple accounts and interpretation of the flood from the 16th to the beginning of the 18th century, as uh, Lydia Barnett has shown in her recent book, After the Flood, provided food for thought about the joint history of humanity and the planet, even in its most physical and structural aspect like orography, climates, astronomical orientation, distribution of oceans and continents. So I hope that you now get a sense of the historically situated forms that planetary environmental reflexivity could take in early modern times. Their existence should not be a surprise because it was an age when Europe constituted the whole Earth as both a cognitive and political object of power knowledge. Second, it was an age when the Little Ice Age accentuated its devastating impacts, suggesting the vulnerability of men and political regimes to natural phenomena of vast geographical scale. Third, it was an age when the Aristotelian and medieval idea of a long Earth's time of millions of years remained very widespread during the Renaissance and offered a framework for what I will call later a geological reflexivities of societies. Third, fourth, it was an age when, as Cosgrove and Martin have highlighted, a planetarity of the Earth was asserted in knowledge exploring the interactions between terrestrial and celestial phenomena, such as cosmography or meteorology, which was then interested not only in the weather, but also in the long distance cycles of water, the cyclic transformation of land surfaces into oceans and vice versa, uh, interested in the long time life of the Earth, in the habitability of the Moon, or in the formation of metals and earthquakes. And fifth, it was an age when the historicity of human becoming, as well as that of the Earth's trajectory, were seen through their subjection to the same God, giving them a common vulnerability and mutual malleability. So, there is growing evidence of historically situated forms of planetary environmental reflexivity over the last half millennium. But this growing and increasingly compelling historical evidence comes in contradiction with the current assumption that awareness of anthropogenic global change down 
all at once in the late 19th century. This standard, once was blind but now can see, thesis has probably become more popular uh, in recent years in relation with the rhetorical constraints that frame discourses in scientific journals and in international arenas. Because to stress the gravity and urgency of an environmental problem in these arenas, it often helps to frame the problem in non-political ways, to cast it as if its full understanding was new and scientific and to attribute ignorance to past actor rather than malfeasance, for instance. So the thesis of a radical novelty of our environment, global environmental consciousness has strongly developed in the wake of discourses around the Anthropocene concept. But besides natural scientists and politicians, key thinkers such as the sociologist Ulrich Beck, the philosopher Bruno Latour, and the historian Dipesh Chakrabarty have also succumbed to the charm of the idea of a radical novelty of our planetary environmental reflexivity. This leads to a standard view that before we, the moderns, did not know that our activities would disrupt the great planetary functionings. According to this green enlightenment story, the societies of the past are told to have had less systemic knowledge than ours, restricting their environmental reflexivities to local phenomena. A true global environmental awareness is held to have emerged only recently, thanks to the blue marble photo of the whole Earth seen from Apollo, the IPCC, the satellites, the modeling and monitoring of the Earth system, or to the development of Earth system science and of the concept of the Anthropocene as a new geological epoch. So the objective of uh, this talk today is to present this once was blind but now can see thesis in a critical uh, presentation of its most brilliant advocates such as Chakrabarty and Beck, and then to provide an alternative conceptual framework around the concept of regimes of planetarity. I propose this notion of regimes of planetarity as a way of historicizing the ways in which societies have organized and thought about their relationships to the planet, its beings and its functionings, at the crossroads of three dynamics. Material dynamics with the world ecologies idiom, cognitive discursive dynamics with the environmental reflexivity idiom, and governance dynamics with the geopower idiom. Ideally, a second section would put this conceptual proposition to the test by documenting the regime of planetarity as it manifested itself at the turn of the 19th and 20th century. But time will be short and you will find this last section in a recent paper that I published in German that you see here. So, first section. Are we just now encountering the planet. In response to global climatic and ecological disruption, Earth system scientists have advanced the Anthropocene as a new geological epoch, and they have reconstructed a history according to which, as James Lovelock puts it, by changing the environment, we have unknowingly declared a war on Gaia. The unknowingly is interesting for me here. In sympathy with the Anthropocene idea and in criticism of globalization, the human and social senses seem to be embarking on a new turn, a geological or planetary turning point. To face the planet, says Connolly, is to accept that we thought 
that what we thought to be an environmental crisis is a geological upheaval. Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak proposed to place the field of comparative literature studies under the sign of the planetary in order to overwrite the globe, as she says. The globe is on the side of the will to control, seen from above. For Spivak, on the contrary, the planetary is on the side of the encounter with this other that we inhabit and these alterities with which we co-evolve on Earth. The planetary is invoked by Spivak as both an exercise in the subversion of globalization, in overcoming a post-colonial critique overtaken by nationalism, and as a renewal of internationalism at a time when our habitat has become vulnerable. Dipesh Chakrabarty is one of the thinkers who pushed at its deepest the reflection on the implication of the Anthropocene and the planetary turn on the paradigms of the human and social sciences. After analyzing the stakes of the Anthropocene idea for the humanities in a key 2009 paper, he sets out in a recent article and forthcoming book to make the planet a humanist category. If centuries of globalization have made us invest the globe, he argues, it is now the time when we encounter the planet. And he characterizes the planetary by five key features opposing it to the global. You have this on the table. First, the planetary is decentering and is a radical otherness. While thinking in terms of the globe and globalization implies an anthropocentric view and a project of conquest. In other terms, the planet is on the side of first nature, while the globe is on the side of the second nature. For him, the concept of the globe is thus intrinsically the bearer of a story of human expansion, as he says, while that of the planet denotes a meeting without will to power with the otherness and the limits of the planet. This planet versus globe boundary is certainly an interesting analytical distinction, but it does not fit any before-after historical periodization. First, many 16th to 19th century authors did use the planet idiom while nevertheless developing tame and control views. And second, the planetary in Chakrabarty's sense as an alterity and externality constraining human agency or pretension to control was largely present in many early modern and 19th century authors, such as Newton, Bernardin of Saint-Pierre, or Humboldt, and especially present in environmental reflexivity of the Romantic age, as you see here in the quote from Saint-Simon. In the second place, Chakrabarty distinguishes the planetary from the global or the earth in that it is not limited to living being. It includes the mineral, the astronomical. As he puts it, the planetary is a necessarily comparatist enterprise, unquote, and it makes it possible to consider terrestrial phenomena in connection and comparison with their equivalent in other planets or stars. Third, while sustainability has been the key environmental issue in centuries of globalization, Chakrabarty views the new issue of the habitability of the Earth as heralding our new encounter with the planetary. Here again, the fact that several pioneers of Earth system sciences have previously, they had previously studied the atmosphere and the workings of other planets this suggests that this second and third trace distinguishing globe thinking from planetary thinking can provide fruitful 
um, ideas and analytical distinctions. However, it would be inaccurate to assert that the planetary thus understood is new in Western environmental reflexivity. Craig Martin's work on meteorology documents a Renaissance feeling for the planetary. The years 1880 to 1914 provide a second counterexample. They were the golden age of cosmical physics, an interdisciplinary program that crossed geophysical objects, storms, electricity in the atmosphere, and atmos astronomical objects like comet, solar corona, and so on. Intense investigations and debates about the habitability of the planet Mars were the occasion to compare the atmosphere of the Earth, Mars, Venus, or Saturn, and their effects on temperatures. And it is during these debates on the ability of Mars and future inability of planet Earth that the popular astronomer Percival Lowell proposed a sequence of six planetologic eras through which any planet would go through, in his view. So geology was then placed within the more generic and comparative approach of planetology. At the same period, uh, in uh, 1913, the uh, Edward Walter Maunder, the British astronomer who gave it its name to the Maunder Minimum, which aggravated the Little Ice Age, he invented the notion of habitable zone, not anymore just to designate regions of the Earth, but in a, like, as in a Renaissance, but in a wider sense to refer to regions of space around the suns that were compatible with the presence of liquid water. A fourth demarcation criteria for Chakrabarti is that, quote, the global refers to matters that happen within human horizons of time, while the planetary processes, including the ones that humans have interfered with, operate in various timetables, some compatibles with human times, others vastly larger than what is involved in human calculation, end quote. In this perspective, the capacity of societies to situate their future and their temporality in connections with the history of the Earth and its large temporalities is viewed as specific to our recent encounter with the planetary. We have seen that this demarcation does not hold against the empirical evidence of past geological reflexivity that I have sketched during the Renaissance or in the natural theology of Noah's Flood. Fifth, Chakrabarti's global with human at its center is ultimately all about forms and values, just like nature, which has always been invested with moral values. On the other hand, he says, the planetary as such, disclosing vast processes of unhuman dimensions, cannot be grasped by recourse to any ideal form. It asks questions of habitability of various life forms, but there is nothing in the history of the planet that can claim the status of a moral imperative." Unquote. This planetary conception hence prevents us against any naturalization of political choices, since there is no balance or harmony of nature. There is no more stationary state of ecosystems. And there is no geological state of the planet, neither the Holocene nor the Paleozoic, that can claim the status of reference standard as the good form of habitation of our planet, because these forms of habitation, uh, habitation of the planet by different forms of life have been multiple. Yet, uh, goes on Chakrabarti, despite this minimal normative authority, the knowledge of the Earth system senses calls for new human affects and new political arrangements to foster planetary habitability.
to summarize Chakrabarti's thesis is that of a radical novelty of our face-to-face -face with the planet, its otherness, its gigantic temporalities, its non-human biophysical dimensions, its limits, its boundaries and systemic processes which constrain and unify the future of human societies. He argues that we now really encounter, quote, planetary processes that humans in the past simply ignored, bracketed, or took for granted. Humans have empirically encountered the planet, deep Earth, always in their history as earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, tsunamis, but without necessarily encountering it as a category in humanist thought. In brief, for Chakrabarti, the last centuries have been those of a globalization as an extension of social relations of a certain type around the globe at the cost of an externalization of an absence of reflexivity upon our relation to the planetary as a biophysical reality having its own agency and temporality. This thesis of radical novelty of our environmental reflexivity fits with many sociologists' reflections on reflexive modernization or ecological modernization. In the risk society, sociologist Ulrich Beck noted that, quote, the modernization process is becoming reflexive. It is itself an object of reflection and a problem." End quote. Especially, we are moving from local to global. Risk, expo quote, risk exposure situations are no longer confined to the place of their appearance, the factory. End quote. Temporally, we are also moving from the emergence of risk associated with modernization to the awareness of their existence, the latency phase of risk is coming to an end. So there's no more latency between appearance of the risk and reflexivity about the risk. So Beck thus divides modernity into two chronological slices. The before of a first modern society, as he says, which is separated by a historical break, as he says, from the now of reflexive modernization, as he says. So, although I cannot uh, develop this today, anthropologists and philosophers around a rather simplified view of the history of a great divide between nature and culture in Western modernity, and geographers around the interesting concept of planetarization, have also contributed to the ones where blind but now can see thesis. This dual and progressive break between, on the one hand, a poorly documented before, stylized as a globalizing but aplanetary modernity, and on the other hand, a now of a planetary environmental reflexivity, does not hold in view of the recent advances in environmental history. But how many counter examples would it take to destabilize the myth of the newness of our global environmental awareness? How many historians, monography and books will be necessary to make a difference? So rather than multiplying such counter examples and empirical evidence, I will now, in the second part of this talk, propose an alternative general framework to give a longer history to these interesting notions of the planetary and planetarization. I propose to define under the concept of regimes of planetarity the historically situated ways 
for human societies, when they reflect on their past and future, of weaving and composing their human agency with the agencies of non-human beings and processes, and this up to the temporal and special scales of the planet. The idea is to historicize planetarity in the same way that Artog, François Artog has done so remarkably with historicity. As you know, François Artog's regimes of historicity refer to the historically situated ways for human societies, when they reflect on their becoming, of composing a past, a present, and a future in some ways. In order to give consistency to my new concepts of regimes of planetarity, I will weave it at the intersection of notions of world ecology, grammars of environmental reflexivity, and geopower. So, first, world ecology. The notion of regimes of historicity mostly belong to a history of ideas. I would like to place my regimes of planetarity concept additionally in dialogue with material and political perspective. So let me start with the material perspective of world ecologies. From environmental humanities to new materialism, from eco-Marxists to Chakrabarti, from environmental historians who have studied the planetary tribulations of climates, plants and animals for half a century, to those who follow the flow of matter and pollutants, from political historians such as Timothy Mitchell to historians of techniques and material practices such as da David Edgerton, a widely shared conviction is that environmental issues invite us to ecologize, to materialize our readings of the dynamics of societies. The concept of the Anthropocene came as an additional incentive to question the restricted and external place left to more than human beings and processes in standard historical accounts. At the horizon is the reintegration of non-human agencies and on the flow of matter of energy in our narratives of states, of empires, of cultures and economies. We are invited to rethink so-called natural entities and processes as crossed by social and to rethink societies as crossed with nature. Far from surrounding the social, the environment traverses it, and the history of societies, culture, and socio-political regimes cannot ignore the flow of microbes, plants and animals, of matter and of energy which weave them. It is from this perspective of a double interiority that we must think, that we must learn to think. It is in these entanglements that Donna Haraway invites us to live well and die. From this perspective, furthermore equipped by numerous recent scientific data and methodologies, the history of the Earth and of societies appears as a mutually transforming coevolution. For several centuries at least, social technical devices have altered terrestrial functionings, not only at local scales, but at that of vast planetary teleconnections. Each age of historical Capitalism, the world systems, as Emmanuel Wallerstein puts it, then corresponds to a world ecology, a key concept introduced by Jason Moore. Thus, with a drop in the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere caused by the Amerindian, Amerindian genocide and the biological re reunification of the world by the Colombian exchange, after 200 million years of separation, 
between the old and the new continent, the planet Earth of 1610 is no longer the same planet Earth as in the 15th century. Likewise, the planet in 1900 is no longer the planet of 1800, with an atmosphere whose carbon concentration is already largely outside the ranges of the Holocene, and with a radically altered zoological, botanical and agricultural map of the planet. The concept of world ecologies, therefore, allows us to think about the social dimensions of the history of planet Earth. And this for at least five centuries, rather than simply since the post-1950 Great Acceleration. And reciprocally, the state of the biosphere, climates and other planetary functionings, in particular geochemical flows, are no longer seen as mere frameworks of human action, but as interacting agents through material as well as symbolic mediations with so-called social, political and cultural dynamics. The transformations of world ecologies are not without effect, and vice versa, on the evolution of matters of concern and of scientific ideas and lines of research, of course, and that's my second point, environmental reflexivity. Uh, a larger environmental history of culture may also investigate the effect of this material transformation of the globe on religious, philosophical, social and political thought, not only in scholarly arenas, but also in popular culture. It is therefore advisable to conceive of planetary environmental reflexivity as cultural forms which co-evolve with world ecologies. So the concept of environmental reflexivity was first proposed by Jean-Baptiste Fresseau's in 2008. The term is preferable to those used until now, such as environmental awareness, uh, roots of the modern environmental movement, or early environmental knowledge, which have these uh, three terms have the disadvantage of carrying with them either an implicit or explicit search for the roots of today's doctrine or sensibilities, or to carry with them an implicit progressive assumptions that awareness was growing or maturing, or that knowledge and data were becoming more compelling, more systemic, more exact as time advanced. The concept of environmental reflexivity assumes itself as an analytical category therefore necessarily anachronistic. Let us not forget that if the term circunfusa is old, that of environment was not really used until the middle of, of the 19th century, only to be consecrated in our contemporary meaning in the last third of the 20th century. In this matter, environmental history faces the same situation as social history. The social, like the environment, did not exist as actor's category in the 18th century. But this does not mean that one cannot do any good social history or environmental history of the 13th century or of the Inca Empire. It is precisely because of its resolutely analytical character that the concept of environmental reflexivity can help avoiding both the search for precursor and the implicit green enlightenment assumptions. In our book, The Shock of the Anthropocene, Jean-Baptiste Fresseau and I had proposed six grammars of environmental reflexivity the first six you see on the table. Uh, Hippocratic reflexivity upon 
surrounding things, from circunfusa to environment, as interacting with bodies and their state of health. So today's uh, United Nations One Health uh, concept belongs to this uh, reflexivity, I could say. Second, a climatic reflexivity upon the reciprocal influences between climates and societies. Third, a web of life reflexivity upon biological diversity and the vulnerabilities and interdependencies within the web of life from the Linnaeus economy of nature to ecology and biodiversity today. Um, fourth, a metabolic reflexivity upon cycles of matter from Aristotle to biochemistry through Lavoisier and Marx metabolism. Fifth, a thermodynamic reflexivity, reading the dynamics of society in connection with notions of force, energy, and entropy. And fifth, a resources reflexivity upon their limits and wise management. From feedback from my empirical work on late 19th to early 20th century imperial age of environmental reflexivity, it became necessary to complete uh, the toolbox with three additional grammars to investigate the multiple lines of environmental reflexivity in a more complete way. So the seventh grammar is a geographic reflexivity thought and practices constituting the earth as a geographic whole. Um, the eighth uh, is a geological reflexivity. So it's about ideas about the long time of the earth and ways of composing the dynamics and temporalities of societies with the dynamics and temporalities of the earth in the same discourse, in the same debates, in the same knowledge. And finally, ninth, a cosmic reflexivity, constituting in ways of inscribing the future of societies and the habitability of the Earth within comparisons and interdependencies with other bodies and celestial phenomena. So note that from a historical perspective, the interesting use of these nine grammars is not to seek within them the cumulative deployment of the same line of thought in a diachronic series of scientific discoveries. It is on the contrary, even within the same apparently familiar grammar, to be attentive to breaks. It is to attempt at describing conceptions with which confront us with the otherness of the knowledge and mental tools of the past. It is also important to study synchronically the connections that actor drew across these nine uh, grammars, as well as the connections that also emerged between the forms of environmental reflexivity of a given epoch and the kind of world ecology and the kind of geopower configuration of the same, same epoch. So let's move to geopower now. As Europe extended its empire over the world, its religious, political, economic and scholarly elites forged affects, discourses, knowledge, norms, instruments and institutions to establish and improve, correct or wise use of nature. In many cases, this correct use of nature was not limited to a particular territory, but related with implicit or explicit discourses about the good management of the entire planet Earth. From, from Golinski, Fogel, Fresos, and Locher's work, we know, for example, that from Columbus to Buffon, 
via the British Royal Society, a theory of a large-scale climate change participated in the 17th and 18th century in the legitimization of the colonial project to civilize and improve America. The notion of geopower is, of course, derived from Michel Foucault's work on biopower. Geopower can be defined as a knowledge power integrating not only life, the bios, as in Michel Foucault, but the planet, the G, in the sphere of economic calculation and government. Undertaking a history of geopower then consists in studying how, at different times and in different places, the Earth as a whole, from the lithosphere to the stratosphere, and by the grasp of its many beings, elements, and per processes, how the Earth as a whole, I said, was constituted as an object of knowledge, discourse, norms, and government. In this way, environmental knowledge and reflexivities are not abstracted from their context to be read only as incomplete ancestors of our current environmental ideas and doctrines. They are positively understood as co-constructed in their own time with historically situated ways of promoting and enforcing a certain right use of the earth. To investigate at a given time how the entire planet Earth was constituted as an object of government requires us to study the institutions, the procedures, the instruments, the knowledge and the discourse, the ideologies, the rationalities and the strategies, which made it possible to enunciate and to enforce this correct use of the planet, which enable to enunciate and govern its improvement or its regeneration under the changing terms of improvement, civilizing, embellishment, development, productivity, natural capital, ecosystem services, stewardship, respect for planetary boundaries, or even more recently reconnecting with the earth. And third, uh, which enable to measure, aggregate and calculate at a large scale, a kind of general interest of the planet or and of the humanity as a whole. And fourth, uh, we are interested in the institution, procedures, ideology and rationalities that enable to govern and legitimize the distribution of the costs and benefits of its exploitation, destruction or conservation, a distribution that is always or most always spatially, socially and temporally unequal. So, um, I leave uh, a general discussion of uh, what uh, this new um, framework could bring to um, environmental history um, or general theory of history. I also leave for the discussion uh, a kind of debate we could have that, okay, maybe it's useful for historians, but uh, what does this new historical knowledge and framework can bring to our current political debate about environmental issues today? What does it change? What kind of difference that does it make if our environmental reflexivity is not so new as some other uh, people uh, have claimed what does really what are the, the political uh, added value of the new framework I am, I am proposing this is these are some things I have a few ideas on that but uh, I, I will uh, also leave you uh, uh, give your opinion about that so just to summarize um, my concept of regimes of planetarity uh, I think is the best kind of answer to the once was blind but now can see uh, discourses. I'm not trying to give many counterexamples. I'm trying to provide a general framework that is situated at the crossroads of 
material dynamics, more than human dynamics, these are the world ecologies, the intersection of cognitive and discursive dynamics, these are the repertoires of environmental reflexivity, and at the intersection with normative and power dynamics with the concept of geopower. Thank you very much.